Hi everybody, welcome to the Chronosphere Lounge. I'm your host, Bill Whittle, uh, as you can see, falling apart. Welcome to the Chronosphere Lounge. I'm your host, Bill Whittle. Who's that idiot? Uh, one day older today, uh, birthday today. Many, many kind wishes from everybody, especially yesterday uh, for my beautiful wife, Natasha. Thank you very much for all of them. They meant the world to us. And I'm 61. All right, well, moving on. Um, I have a, uh, a theory today I'll get to in a minute, uh, but before I present this theory, I just thought I'd run you the latest uh, data that I found here. Just I keep going back to this because I, it's, it's changing, it's in real time, and I haven't found anything really that would give me any reason to believe that this is not a pretty decent source of information. For the last several days now, I've been talking about um, a, a website called uh, weatherhealth.us. And uh, I go there uh, every day, and I get a look at the latest data. Uh, for those of you who may be a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, is it health weather? I, it is. It's health weather, my bad. I'm just losing it here. That's it. Healthweather.us. I've been talking about it before. I've been talking about it. I did a whole show on it. Um, health weather US is uh, basically a map that's put out by a company called Kinsa. Uh, and Kinsa produces smart thermometers. They basically have uh, thermometers, take a temperature, it's a little Bluetooth in there, communicates to your cell phone, and then you can elect to upload that data uh, to a national database. It doesn't take any of your uh, personal information, at least that's my understanding. And it, um, and it basically charts a, a map of, of how the country's doing in terms of temperature. I did not know it at the time, but I read the... Um, I read the founder's statement, and he said that that's basically the idea, is to provide a real-time uh, interactive map that you can zoom in on for every one of the counties in the, in the country. And basically, as I've says, said before, and I'll say a few times here before I get into my uh, uh, radical, unpopular uh, COVID-19 theory, uh, what, what their map shows is, um, is not COVID-19, has no way to measure for the virus, in fact, one of our big problems from the beginning has been we don't know what the general health of the population is. We don't know how many people are sick. Hard to tell what a mortality rate is if we don't know how many people have it and so on. Um, but what I find interesting about this map and why I, I keep coming back to it is because all it is measuring is temperatures from 178,000, I think, 180,000 people every day are uploading their temperatures, uh, just their body temperatures, to this website specifically to provide this map. I didn't realize that was their intent at the time. And so what you get is you get a pretty wide sample from all across the country of where, um, hey, Dave, big booty's going back to the road. Uh, Dave is one of our guys here, been regular from ever, Dave Olson, and uh, he's uh, delivering hand sanitizers from Minnesota to Florida, if I realize. And I hate to interrupt myself in midstream like that. God knows I never do it before, but Dave, you are a hero for all of us. I uh, was at the grocery store earlier and, and, and thanked the guy who's doing the, the checkout. It's, it's one of the things I'm going to be talking about today, but um, no kidding, seriously. Uh, you know, you're out there interacting with people and, and, and you're keeping the store stocked and we just couldn't be proud of her and i proud of you. And, and I, I, that goes for all of the truck drivers out there and hospital workers and all of it. So um, please uh, pass that on and just a real honor and pleasure to have you here uh, and stay safe out there. Um, okay, so back to uh, back to this this Kinsa thing. So this so this map uh, is a map of um, of people's body temperatures, and since one of the um, pretty much nearly universal symptoms of serious case of COVID nineteen is a fever, this app is able to tell when people are running fevers, and it also has a pretty good understanding, a pretty good statistical model of what we would expect to see with the flu, and that's factored in and all the rest of it. So let me just show you this latest data, then I'll go to my radical, unpopular uh, COVID-19 crisis theory. Um, so uh, let's see if I can land on this the right way. Is this it? Yes. This is for today. Um, I will very briefly go over this because I know I've gone over a bunch of people. I'll try to make it shorter and shorter every time. Uh, this is what the uh, 180,000 smart thermometers in the United States are showing right now that Kinsa is tracking. Uh, the observed dots are actual data. The blue dotted line is what mathematical, mathematical models based on historical data would expect to see in terms of fevers and body temperatures that are high 
and that blue dotted line represents what we would expect to see from flu, which produces a fever. And you can see that the blue dotted line is decreasing because the uh, flu is a seasonal disease. There's less of it in the summer, more of it in the winter. And if we continued past the right side of the margin, that dotted line curve would tick back up again, and so on. Um, the, uh, the blue shaded area is the error bars, and you can see that the measured data, the observed dots, the orange dots, pretty much match what you'd expect for the flu, and then suddenly they started to depart from the norm. They started getting above the blue line, and then above the error bars. When they get above the error bars, they turn red. And right about the time when they get to the second to last red dot, is when social distancing is put in place more or less. And you can see that the number of fevers begins to fall and fall and fall. Rapidly, it goes below the red, the dotted line, the blue line, then it goes below the blue error bars. And everything below the blue bars are temperatures that are lower, fewer fevers in the country than you would expect to see even from the flu. So we are now, once again, every single day, According to this data of this sample set, every single day, fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer people are running temperatures, including for the flu. So that's uh, awfully good news. Here's, um, here's the three maps for today. Look at that. These are observed illnesses for flu-like symptoms. And what it's saying is is that across the United States, with the exception of a little cluster now, because this is real-time data as of yesterday, little tiny little area that's mild, uh, maybe even moderate up in the New York area, but vir virtually the entire country is showing low levels of flu-like symptoms, low levels uh, of flu-like symptoms. That's a good sign, because if this, if this uh, virus were exploding, we'd be seeing temperatures and fevers soaring all over the place, and we're not. Uh, the other map, these are the pull-down maps you can get at um, he uh, healthweather.us. Uh, here's a map of atypical illness, cumulative atypical illness. What this basically does is it looks at where fevers are higher than they would be expected just due to flu. I hope that makes it clear. This is a map that shows where people's fevers are higher than we would expect them to be including factoring for the flu. It's atypical. So if you look at NA means no information, obviously the slate, the dark gray areas show where there's none and anything that's orange or red is higher than you would expect for the flu. And that also matches pretty well with the, with the COVID-19 thing. And by the way, if you look at uh, Florida, you can see that uh, Broward County, Dade County, Palm Beach County are, are all still very hot, probably the hottest spots in the nation right now. If you look at Florida, in fact, there's something interesting here. You go all the way up to the top of Florida, right at the border with Georgia, that's Jacksonville. Come down the East Coast, every one of the counties on the coast is uh, above average or well above in terms of more than flu-like uh, fevers out there. All the way down to Key West, all the way around on the west side, and all the way up to about, uh, I want to say that's Crystal Key up there, somewhere like that. Notice the center of the state, though, is not uh, showing that. And as you get up into the, the center of the, up above, you know, Gainesville, let's say, it's not showing anything. Do you know why I think that is? I think that those orange areas outlining Florida are there because those are Florida beaches. And what we're seeing now are the fevers that are generated by, uh, by a, um, a bunch of kids that decided to go out and, uh, and party during spring break. Now, uh, Teddy Antis points out that 180,000 people is only 0.05% of the USA population. That's absolutely true. But many of uh, the, the polls that determine things like uh, who's going to vote for what are based on a sample that's sometimes two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 people. Uh, it, it's astonishing how much accurate information can come from such relatively small samples. I, I was blown away by that. Obviously, polls are not obviously correct, and this is not a map of COVID-19 uh, infections. This is a map of people using the Kinsa smart thermometer who are showing temperatures higher than you would expect for temperatures at, of the flu at this time of year. Nevertheless, as we've seen before, it matches up real well with where the COVID-19 hotspots are and the cold spots. California is doing crazy good. I'll get to that in a minute. And just one final one here, and that is the trend this map was solid blue except for 
hot spots in Tennessee and uh, New England and New York a couple days ago. They've gone. That means nothing but good news. What this map shows is that the, the influenza type illnesses around us are holding steady. They're not increasing. That's what you'd expect to see if, if the coronavirus was in a breakout. And the entire country has essentially cooled down. Um, so uh, eventually the whole country, if the whole country goes to that steady gray, then what that means is, is that the temperatures were much hotter because of the virus, COVID-19 virus, the, the country's cooled down. And when it goes to steady gray, that means we are now exactly on the flu path or below it. Anyway, that's, um, that's it. And uh, just to recap to the one really salient slide is this one. You can see that according to the sample of Kinsa Smart Thermometers, which is not a scientific survey, but nevertheless is still pretty, pretty compelling data, you could see that we were looking at a real spike. Those red dotted lines would have continued to get higher and higher and higher, moved up to the right, headed northeast, and they didn't. They headed southeast, and, and that's all. Um, that's what the data is showing us from human body temperatures and theories. And now... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with that um, with that beautiful uh, data set up, uh, allow me to present this. I know this is undoubtedly going to cost me a lot of members and people who've been around forever and all the rest of it. I apologize for that, but nevertheless, here it comes and, and I'm sticking to it. I've spent a fair amount of time in the last several days looking in the comment sections on left-wing blogs, on right-wing blogs, and I've seen things there from a relatively small number of the same people just continuing the argument. And um, the whole thing runs the gamut from uh, Trump is, uh, is, a, is a murderingly incompetent uh, buffoon who... who who has caused the death of, of thousands of Americans, maybe millions, because of his ego and his incompetence and his stupidity and not listening to the medical experts at his side, and the whole thing is his fault. On the other side, I've seen things that said that this is nothing more than the flu, that this is absolutely, uh, the whole thing is a complete hoax, and, um, and that the whole thing is designed to wreck the economy, and I've heard everything in between. Um, I've been called, uh, you know, a collaborationist. I've been called a person who just easily abandons constitutional principles. I've also been called a person who makes too much out of this. I've been called a person who makes too little out of it. So here comes my radical, unpopular coronavirus crisis theory. My theory is, is that we have been actually doing this very, very, very well very, very well. Those of you that uh, want to depart at this point, I don't blame you. Undoubtedly, we will see the, uh, the, the uh, attendance just fall off like crazy because nobody I've ever heard is even taking this position. But this is a position that makes me unpopular with both polls. I don't believe that Donald Trump's incompetent, and I don't believe that, uh, that he's doing it from financial gain. I don't believe there's things he could have done that could have saved a lot of lives that he didn't do in, in advance. Conversely, I don't think the thing is a hoax. I don't think the thing is a joke. I don't think that the reports coming out of New York hospitals of, of doctors and EMTs who are looking into the camera and saying, we've never seen anything like this before. We are just hanging on by the skin of our teeth. I don't think that's fake. I don't think that's a joke. I don't think uh, that that's doctors who are, who are basically freaking out over seasonal flu. Um, if I thought either one of those were true, I would, uh, I would change my mind, but I don't. So my radical, unpopular COVID-19 coronavirus crisis theory is, is that we have done this very well. And the fact that the numbers are much lower than we expected is not due to the fact that we had uh, invented a crisis, and it's not due to the fact that Donald Trump did a great job or a bad job or anything. It's that we faced a serious global pandemic that was going to cost us, I would say, if we had done nothing, I think a reasonable estimate would have been something like several hundred thousand additional deaths. And you can say, well, those would have been old people and so on, and I'll get to the economic, economic argument in a minute. But in terms of how we've handled this 
as a country, with one notable exception. I think that, that this has been stellar. When I look at this chart, whoops, sorry, uh, this one, what I'm seeing is I am seeing that, that social distancing has knocked the number of fever-like symptoms in the United States down so far that we are now seeing, if I'm just glancing at the chart, I'm, I'm looking at something that says we're seeing 20% of the total number of fevers we would see just from regular flu. That this social distancing, I'll get to the price in a minute, but that this social distancing has not only flattened the curve and done what it's supposed to have done in terms of the COVID-19 spread, but it's actually knocked the flu on its ass. It's actually taken the flu almost out of the game. And as everybody's pointed out from the beginning, and this is part of my um, unpopular, irrational, crazy uh, theory, is that, is that yes, the fact that, the, that these temperatures are down means that not only did COVID-19 get severely stopped in its tracks by this social distancing, but even the flu, and you could actually make the case, and statisticians, statisticians will be able to, when this is over, be able to tell us whether or not this aggressive social distancing ended up saving lives. Uh, and I don't mean saving lives from COVID-19. I think that's a given. It is possible, it is possible that we could have a net gain in lives as a result of COVID-19 arriving here and what we did in terms, in terms of stopping it. So as far as the medical thing goes, I think we've actually done this really well. And here's some more radical, unpopular, uh, uh, crazy talk for you. I think that, that uh, Dr. Fauci basically has done a very good job. I think his job is to minimize deaths, and the advice that he has been giving the president is advice needed to minimize deaths. And the people who say that he's hysterical or whatever, I don't think that's it. I think he's I think he's an honorable man, a smart man, knows what he's doing, and he is doing what he's supposed to do, which is give the president advice in order to minimize the casualty count. And if giving advice that minimizes the casualty count says lock the country down for 18 months, that doesn't mean that, that, that he's crazy, and it doesn't mean that he uh, is trying to destroy the country or the economy or that he's incompetent. It simply means that he is saying that my job is to minimize casualties. And if you want to minimize casualties, Mr. President, there you go. His reluctance to, um, to back uh, hydrochloroquine, uh, to me, which many people say, well, he's just completely incompetent. He's lost his mind or whatever. Dr. Fauci is, a, is an epidemiologist, and he is a traditionally classical research scientist. He is not, he is not capable. I don't think it's just a question of his personality, although I'm sure that's a part of it. But I don't think he is is is. I don't think he's uh, capable, and furthermore, nor do I think he should come out and recommend these these drugs that are clearly working. Because Dr. Fauci is an epidemiologist, and he is a person whose credibility is important, and he cannot come out and say this is working until he can prove it scientifically. And so I think he's doing his job. I think he's doing his job very well. Same for Dr. Uh, Dr. Burks. Now. It's not Dr. Fauci's job to save the economy. And it's not Dr. Birx's job to save the economy. And it's not their job to recommend uh, treatments that haven't passed FDA approval yet. That's not their job. That's not what they're, they're doing. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. That's not their job. The president's job is to walk a line between these two different positions, these two different uh, timers that are running. And, and President Trump has to make some tough decisions, and he has to adjust those decisions on, on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis. So when people say, well, Trump changed his mind about this or changed his mind about that, see, what an idiot, what a terrible leader. That's not the sign to me of an idiot or a terrible leader. A person who changes his mind as the data changes is a competent, respectful, and 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 ultimately confident person. If you can change your mind as the data changes, that's what you want when you have a situation where no one's been before. We've never, ever seen anything like this before. This is the first time in human history with it, that we have any science of anyway, where we have run into 
a contagious virus that has never been seen before. That's why it's the novel coronavirus. So when people say, well, he should have done more earlier, how do you know that? Nobody knew that. World Health Organization was saying nothing to worry about. Dr. Fauci was saying nothing to worry about back in February. Do you know why Dr. Fauci was saying that there was nothing to worry about back in February? It's not because he's evil, and it's not because he's stupid, and it's not because he's partisan, it's not because he, he backed Hillary Clinton in terms of her health. It's because Dr. Fauci made the best recommendation he could make at the time, given the information available to him based out of coming out of China. And so I don't find him at fault. I don't find him incompetent. I don't find him partisan. And despite all of the fact that all of, all of my followers are going to leave as a result of this, I don't think that it's a coup. I don't think it's a power play. I don't think it's a fake. I don't think anything. I think he's doing the best job he possibly could have done. Donald Trump is doing the best job he could have done. Donald Trump had the moral courage to stop, to stop travel from China as soon as Donald Trump became convinced that this was real. And you have to understand that when that decision was made, we did a Bill Whittle now about this today. I've forgotten the name of the guy in the, in the cabinet who was saying, this is a serious issue, Mr. President. He's saying in January, you've got to cut this, this ties and, these, and this travel to China. And the New York Times wrote an article said, oh, if only Donald Trump had listened to his own advisors, we wouldn't be in this kind of situation. Well, Tom Cotton. No, it's not Tom Cotton. It was somebody else. It was somebody in his cabinet, uh, trade secretary uh, dealing with China. Uh, I, I just did it this morning. I have no memory at all. I'm just, just, just worthless. But people are saying, oh, well, he should listen to him. How do you know? We didn't know he was right. The World Health Organization was saying no problem. Chinese government was saying no problem. Epidemiologists here and around the world were saying no problem. Donald Trump made a decision to cut ties to China when the evidence became strong enough for him to take this action. And he was vilified for this, and, and so on and so on. I think he's done as good a job as a human being can do. And when I say I think we've done a good job with this, with one exception, I'm not just talking about Republicans either, I'm not just talking about Donald Trump. When Gavin Newsom made the announcement that California was going to get locked down, he saw, uh, uh, so, let me go back to Trump for a second. Uh, John, John Galt points out that he saw that model from the Imperial College uh, that was done by um, uh, Niall Ferg Nigel Ferguson. Um, when he saw the numbers that were coming out of that model, he changed his mind. And so did everybody else in the world. Every other leader in the world did this because one of the leading epidemiologists in the world produced a model that says, if we don't do anything, this is what's going to happen. Does that mean that the model was wrong? I don't know that the model was wrong. I don't know. It's, it's possible that, in fact, I'm beginning to think more and more likely that the social distancing is enormously more effective than we think it is. And I'm coming to the cost, don't worry. I'm coming to the cost. But whether the model was right or wrong, it's not like the guy made a model wrong intentionally. If he put the worst case scenario out there, what would you do if you had that kind of reputation and that kind of, and, and you had the best tools available. What if instead of this whole thing being a giant conspiracy or a giant number of, of incompetent moves, what if this guy who made this model, Dr. Ferguson, was a man of integrity who decided that this was the best estimate he could come up with with the information he had at the time and decided to say, if I don't say something about this, then we're going to be in a world of trouble. What about that? What if, what if the guy's not a member of the Communist Party or, or so on? Now, who, on the other hand, they're different. I'm coming to them. But what if? What if that was? What if it was his best guess at the time? And what if? And here's something really important. Pay attention to this uh, global warming uh, uh, proponents out there. What if? What if this uh, Dr. Ferguson, who made those initial models at Oxford, what if he had not had a little more moral courage than he had? In other words, what if he had decided that? Well, I've put this model out there. I can't very well retract it. The entire world is freaked out. I can't very well say I was wrong. What if he didn't have that moral courage? What if he stuck to his guns? What if he didn't have the moral courage to say, I don't know whether my model's wrong or not, but the numbers that my model is producing are not matching what I'm seeing in the real world. I am changing my estimate. And I'm revising it down. What if he lacked the moral courage to do that? What if he wasn't good enough? What if we'd had somebody worse? Not a question if we'd had somebody better. What if we'd had somebody worse? What if he had a model that showed him data, he put the data in, here's the numbers he came out, and as time went on, we began to see that things like social distancing and lockdowns were having a major effect, and he said, okay, good, we're gonna, re we're gonna, we're gonna give this a look again, and we're gonna revise things down. And what if, what if included in all of this data was the realization that 
social distancing is working, and until we get on the backside of this curve, if we tell people that no, these things have a tenth of the of the fatal of the mortality that that we thought they would. What if we advertise that and people just say, oh, so we just give up on this on this thing that's working so well? What if the social what if the social quarantine is working beyond our wildest dreams, and that's what that data in terms of temperatures is showing me. I'm coming to the cost. I haven't forgotten about the cost. But what if? What if we did this as well as it could be done? Radical, crazy talk. It's crazy talk. What if? And what if Gavin Newsom and, and, and Mario Cuomo did the best job that they could, and in fact have done a good job? What, New York deaths are, are looking like they're considerably lower. Did they say, come to New York? Did the health commissioner of New York say, yeah, come on out, enjoy the, the Lunar Festival? Yes, she did. Yes, she did. And she's a big old progressive, and that's just safe for the sake of argument that that was her best call at the time. Now, in her particular case, I don't think that was a wise call, but you know what? I didn't live in the future at the time. So she was balancing as was de Blasio and all these other people that we can find fault with, as Donald Trump and de Blasio, when people in New York were saying, no, come on out to the Lunar Festival, you know what they're doing? They're balancing economic need against a potential biological threat that hadn't materialized yet, and they made a call. It was the wrong call, clearly. But what if it wasn't just plain stupidity or meanness or politics? What if it was just their best, their best attempt to try and balance this whole thing? What if, what if Mario Como, uh, not Mario, uh, what if uh, the current mayor, uh, governor of uh, uh, Andrew Como was doing the best job he could? I started doing these, stratos these chronosphere lounges because during a stratosphere lounge show, uh, coming up on three weeks ago tomorrow, next day, two days from now, Gavin Newsom announced while the show was going on, somebody said, hey, your state's locked down. And I just said, the hell it is? What, what the hell is he talking about? And the, and the announcement was bizarre. You will remain in your homes until further notice, and you will remain in your homes, and, 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 and no one is allowed to leave, period. It was such a drastically badly written message that I said, well, Garcetti says we can go for walks and, and hikes and walk our dog and, and, and ride our bike and hike. Do we have to do that indoors? What if, instead of this just being a power grab and all the rest of it, what if that was the best announcement he could make at the time because he was terrified at looking at huge numbers of people in California dead and he really thought that was going to happen and what if maybe it actually would have happened or at the very least at the very least that that was the best guess of what's happening in the future that they could possibly come up with I look back on it now and I see all these other things and I think my god you know I, this this action in California saved some lives and when I look at those charts that I showed a couple days ago on the, on the temperature graphs, which is the only thing we have, we don't have a reliable map of COVID-19 infections. We can't test who doesn't have it. We don't have enough test kits. The reason that this thermometer data means so much to me is that millions and well, thousands and thousands and thousands of people are reporting normal temperatures. It's not measuring the virus, but it is showing us what the baseline is. It's showing us who's sick and who's not. It gives us something to compare it to. So what if he, what if Gavin Newsom actually did, did something that saved a lot of lives, a lot of lives? And, and, and what if everybody made the best decision they could make at the time? With one exception, what if that's all the case? What if that's the case? And what if it's, if it's neither one of these polls? What if it, no, it's not a fraud. And no, it's not the end of the world. It's, it's in the middle. And people are doing the best they can trying to navigate their way through this. Right now, we are starting to see, in fact, we're clearly seeing, that the numbers coming from New York, although horrific, and if you don't think that a thousand people dying a day, who shouldn't be dying in terms of, in terms of statistical numbers of deaths, if you don't see that thousand-yard stare on the eyes of those, of those uh, emergency room doctors in New York and elsewhere, if you don't see that thousand-yard stare in the eyes of nurses and EMTs that have come in from all around the country, this is not a joke, and this is not a fraud, and this is not the flu. This is serious, serious business. But as these numbers continue to come in, as they come in lower and lower and lower than what we expected that they would be, what if that's not a result of people overhyping the disease? What if that's a result of the actions that we took working? What a novel freaking idea that would be. This is why my theory is so radical and why it's so unpopular. 
is because what if we did this, have done this, continue to do this as well as it could be done? Who would we blame then? Who do we have to blame? What if we're doing it as well as it could possibly be done? And I think when this song's all said and done, when it's all over, you're going to look at the U.S. mortality rates. You're going to see how they compare to the rest of the world, how low they are on a per capita basis. You're going to look at, um, at, at you're going to have de definable graphs of how these infections fell off when these measures were put into place. And I'm coming to the cost. I haven't forgotten that. And you're going to see where these numbers fell. And by the time that this is all done, 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 and we have enough testing to know just exactly what the virulence was, how infectious it was, all of this, then we will be able to put together a graph or some kind of number a year from now, maybe less, maybe more. We will be able to see on a chart that this is what would have happened if we didn't do anything, and this is what happened because of what we did. And we don't have to play this game of well, what if we did this a week earlier or a week later. No, here's what we did. Here's what would have happened based on how this thing spread. This is scientific laboratory information. What if we're doing it as well as it can be done? Now to the cost. Without question, without question, this has been a catastrophe for the country's economy. It's been a catastrophe. It's been a catastrophe for the world economy. But we don't have a right to live without catastrophes, you know. We have not gotten to the point where we can control nature just by wanting things. I know we think we have, but we haven't. What if this catastrophe is as mitigated as it can be? I know this is an unpopular opinion. But what we don't know is, we don't know how many people would have gotten sick and died or have gotten sick and been out of business. We don't know what the grief load would have been if we hadn't done anything. All we know is what we've got, what we've, all we know is what we have because of what we did. And honestly, folks, if right now, three weeks into this thing, if we're sitting around saying this is nothing like as bad as we thought it would be, and why do we have to go to all this trouble, and why did we destroy the economy for nothing? Isn't that kind of a case of like saying, you know, the reason that the numbers are low is because of what we did. The reason that we're seeing fewer hospitalizations is because of what we did. So it's a catastrophe, yes. But to say that it's a catastrophe that's caused by politicians or that it's a power player, that it's something that, that people cooked up in order to destroy the economy. And no, it's a catastrophe. It's a meteor hits the earth. And, and we don't have to like the fact that a meteor hitting the earth does trillions and trillions of dollars of economic damage. We don't have to like it. And I don't like it. And you don't like it either. But that doesn't mean that it's not a real catastrophe. And we have no right to expect to live in a world where things like this don't happen. I have said to my wife many times, as we go shopping, as we stand out and we see things, the first couple days really put a, put a gigantic hole in me. When I started seeing empty shelves in American stores, I really lost it. I really did. It hit me very, very hard. But in the time since then, as we go out and we look at this different world that we're living in right now, I say to myself, if this is the worst thing that we have to go through as a people, if this is it, this is the worst thing that the country's been through in a hundred years? Really? This is it? This is our, this is our, our Stalingrad is staying at home with 2,000 channels of television and the internet and, and food available and, and, and all of this stuff delivered to, this is it? This is our crisis? This is, this is, this is it? Please, please, no. We got hit by a meteor and we have paid a price in it for the economy, and we're going to continue to pay a price for it in the economy, but the economy can recover, and people can. And we don't know how many people we would have lost if we hadn't done the social distancing. And this argument, which I originally bought into myself, which is, well, they're old people and they're about to die anyway. Do we want to live like that, really? Is that, is that the metric that we want to, to make our decisions on? That, that uh, well, they're, you know, they're older people and they're, they're going to kick it anyway. Is that really where we want to be as a people? Is that, is that the America that we want? Isn't that the America that we fight against? Isn't that entire idea what we fight so hard against socialized medicine for? The idea that, well, you know, technically speaking, economically, you're not worth saving. Isn't that, the, isn't that what makes us all sick? Isn't that the argument that makes us just want to just, you know, give it all up? Sorry. No, 
you, you, it costs too much money to keep you alive. Here's your pain pills. Go home and die. Um, I don't want to live in that country, and we don't. And we've made enormous sacrifices to save as many lives as possible. And that's something I'm proud of, something you should be proud of, too. And that has been an effort on the part of the president, Democratic governors, uh, health experts. Everybody's vilified. Everybody's criticized. Everybody's second-guessed. But no one is sitting here saying, holy God, we've got 5 million Americans dead because we didn't do what they told us to do. They were right. We were wrong. No, we had no. We're winning. We're winning. So now to the authoritarian angle, which is the biggest cost. Let's talk about that. Of all the things that, have, and, and I have to tell you, I've had virtually nothing but nice comments, and, and as, is the, as is my want and my inclination, and as most people who are like me, who are kind of artistic, kind of, you know, sensitive souls, and other storyteller, you know, kind of come from the theater department, kind of, we have pretty thin skin, and I have thin skin. How Ben Shapiro does his job is beyond my imagination. I simply don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it, how he goes into those rooms and faces those, those, those people. I don't, I don't know how he does it. My skin is much thinner than that. And I have, from the beginning of this, been, been able to tolerate criticism from the left. I understand that's part of the job, even when it smears, even when it's lies, and you know, you're a scientific racist on, the cover, uh, on, on an article in the, in the LA Times. That's the price I pay for being in this business. But when I hear criticism from the right, that goes through me like a hot knife. And when people say I'm backing this hoax and I should stop, or when people say things like I'm, I'm enabling this totalitarian takeover of the United States and all the rest of it, that really stings. And so when it stings, I ask myself in private, not on camera, I just ask myself and I confer with my wife about this and I say, am I right about this? Am I wrong? Should, should I be on a different position? Should I be taking the position that we should have simply gone out there and taken our losses? That we should have simply done nothing, preserved the economy, as if doing nothing would have preserved the economy, as if there would have been no consequences for this at all? Am I the kind of person that, that, that wants to do that, that would, that would like to see these, these rates just spike so that people, forget the people who are going to die of the, of the virus, so that people who go to the hospital because they are having a heart attack or they're, or they're having a seizure and they can't get treatment and they die out on the streets because, because of these number of people that we're dealing with in, in this thing blowing through the ceiling? Is that, is that the kind of person I want to be? No. So now on to the main point, and that is the whole totalitarian the loss of the freedom and, 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 and the sheeple have just simply given up their rights and, 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 and abandoned our principles and, and, and we, the government tells us what to do and we just do it and what's happened to the country. I can't speak for you. I can only speak for me. When Gavin Newsom issued an order that Californians had to stay indoors. I thought about this very carefully. Prior to, this, uh, prior to the stay-at-home order, I said the only reason you could get me to stand in a group of 10,000 people right now would be as if somebody told us that we couldn't. When he, mentioned, when he said this, I thought, okay, is this, what is this? Is this the test? Is this the moral test? Is this the Rubicon? Is, if this is a slippery slope argument that we've been making for 50 years now or 100 years, is this the point of no return? He tells me I have to stay indoors, that my freedom of travel is restricted and I can't go to work or other people can't go to work and I'm agreeing to this. Is this, is this it? Is this the final retreat? Is this the, is this the, the moment when I should have grabbed my AR-15 and stood up for our rights or, 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 and I just chickened out? Is it? Is it? When deep reflection and ongoing reflection of this has had a chance to sink in, I realize that I have not, with the exception of one person who's, who was out there wave surfing and who was arrested when he came back, and other pieces of ridiculousness, with the exception of, of, of uh, people, uh, law enforcement officers going into a church and arresting the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the church leader, because he violated, um, you know, uh, no groups larger than 50 orders. With the exceptions of things like that, 
And when I say things like that, I'm talking about in the last month, maybe, maybe five individual cases in a nation of 330 million people. I have seen maybe five cases where I thought that crossed the line. But the bottom line in California, which was the first state in the country to lock down, the bottom line in California is that buried in that announcement was the admission that the police will not be enforcing this order. And when that happens, folks, when it's clear that the police will not be enforcing the order, once I went back to work, came home and went back to work the second day without checkpoints, without, without anything like this, I realized that the difference between this and tyranny is that this has no teeth, and tyranny does. If it had teeth, I'd treat it completely differently, but it didn't. What that announcement was and continues to be all across this country, at least in, in the number of cases <clears throat> where it's not true, I can count on, on, on certainly on two hands. But in California, speaking for myself, I was told to stay at home for the public good. And I took a look at the situation and I said, okay. I took a look at the number of jobs that are exempted and what they were. And to be perfectly honest with you, under I didn't see Gavin Newsom's, but I saw Garcetti's. I read it very carefully. The number of jobs that were exempted were larger than the number of jobs I could have imagined that would have been prohibited. And in those exemptions was one for people who were in media, including online media. So I took a little copy of that screenshot and I highlighted it in case I get pulled over. Here it is. But you know what? The main point is what the point is, is the point is I didn't get pulled over. No one asked for my papers. No one stopped me and said, you can't go there. No one asked for my papers. And what I realized looking back on it, and I'm speaking for myself here is that rather than this being a failure of my willingness to, 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 to stand up against tyranny, the reason that I complied with this order is not because I'm one of the sheeple who, who uh, doesn't deserve to live in America anymore. The reason I complied with this order is because it made sense to me. Because it made sense to me. And looking back on the whole thing, I realize, and my conscience is clear, because my compliance with this has been voluntary and not coerced. At no point in this process has coercion ever, ever affected me. It has affected two or three or five or 10 cases in the country of 330, 40 million people, and that's significant. And when people arrested that guy, I went up and I said, this is an entirely different thing. You've crossed the line, de Blasio. You've crossed the, when you threatened to, to, to pen it, shut down churches and, and keep them closed, I, I, that was crossing the line. But how far did we cross the line and how many times? Almost none. We don't live in a perfect world. We're imperfect creatures. We do the best we can. And, and even on the social authoritarian watch out for your freedoms aspect of it, I don't know how it could be done much better only because this makes sense to me and, and I put a high value on my fellow citizens' lives. Now, where do we go from here? Let me just put one more cap on this. When people talk about losing our freedoms and, and all the rest of this stuff, if you, I've got to be very careful about how I put this because I don't want to be misunderstood about this. In my opinion, on the personal decisions that I make on a daily basis for me, my family, and all the people I care about, my ethical matrix, my philosophical code, and my belief in conservative values tells me that this crisis was not a political crisis. It was not a power play. It was not a grab for authority. I'm not denying that many people would like to make it uh, many of the things that have happened permanent. I understand that. But this was not a political order. This was a meteor from space order. And it made sense to me. And the data seems to be showing that we saved a lot of lives by doing that. Now, the question is, the question is, the ultimate question is, economic damage I'll come back to, but the ultimate question is, by doing this, have we, have we lost, ha have, we, have we lost our freedoms? Have we done all of this? Is all of it, um, should we have done it? In other words, should we have done it? 
for me, for myself, I think, yes, we should have done it. I think we need to get back to work as quickly as possible. I think the fact that these numbers are so much lower than what we feared they would be and what we expected they would be, I think that since they're so much lower, we'll get back to work earlier. And we'll get back to work with less permanent long-term damage in terms of a number of different areas. And you're free to disagree with me about all of this. That's fine. Um, Ohio prosecutor Joe deters stay at home, kill yourself, violators orders. I can't, I don't have time to read that. But look, were there extra suicides? Yes, there were. And there continue to be. And there were businessmen who committed suicide when they had to shut down their restaurant. All of it. I understand all of that. I do. But nobody asked for this. This is the thing that I keep coming back to again and again and again, because there's a future I want to talk about to conclude this unpopular, crazy, radical idea of mine. We didn't ask for this, and it came from out of the blue. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, people say I blame China. I blame China too. And this is where I'm going to get to the bright side of all of this. But right now, I'm looking at a country that has made enormous sacrifices, enormous, enormous financial sacrifices to save as many of its citizens as it possibly could. And I'm proud of that. And I'm proud to have been a part of it. I really am. I'm proud of myself that I stayed at home for this. And I'm proud of the people that I meet when I go out and go shopping who are cheerful and who are optimistic and who are brave and carrying on and donating things. And for every case of hoarding I see, there are 200 cases of people who are donating food and donating medicine and giving up the, the, the patents they own on respirators. And for every single one of these things I see, I see hundreds of times more positive things coming out of this. In fact, the, the isolated incidents of things like hoarding and shutting down churches are so unusual in a nation this size. And when I think about what we have done for each other, the magnitude of these two things, the out of balance they are, the, 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 the massive amount of good that we accomplished is... It, see, the problem with the good is the problem with what we've done is just one simple problem. The problem with, with us trying to say that we did this right is that we don't have a control. We don't get to look out there and say, oh, well, see, if we hadn't done anything, there'd been, there'd been four million people dead or two or one or whatever. We don't have a control. All we know, all we have out of this, our only reward is that the numbers are much, much lower than we thought they would be. And that to me, and that drop in temperatures that goes not only below what we would expect to see for COVID-19, but that this, uh, that this social distancing has knocked the number of, of fevers down so low that we are now seeing a fifth, a tenth of what we would have seen just from the regular flu is telling me that we did something right. So now, did they take my liberty away? Nobody stood outside my door with a gun and told me I can't leave. If they had, we'd be having a different discussion right now. We'd be having a very different discussion right now. Then we would have had a situation where, okay. So was the Constitution shredded? If there had been soldiers outside my house telling me that I couldn't leave, you could make a pretty strong case that were, that were the truth, but that didn't happen. It didn't happen to me, and it didn't happen to you either. So now what do we do going forward? What does the future look like? Well, oh, by the way, by the way, during this procedure, during this entire time, no one came after my guns. No one threatened to come after my guns. No one called me and said, turn my guns in. They just asked me to stay at home and wear a mask to save Americans' lives. And that's what I was willing to do. And I'm still willing to do that. Because if they had gone around looking for guns, then you'd hear a different argument from me. But they didn't, so you don't. Um, so what happens now? Well, this has been an expensive experience for us and an expensive lesson in terms of lives. I think what we have done has, has really mitigated the cost of that lesson, but the economic damage is there, continues to be there, and so on. People who are saying that this is going to put us into a 10-year depression, a three-year depression, I think that's just plain nuts. The, the depression and the recessions have come about from the fact that there were no jobs to go to. There are jobs to go to. I understand businesses are closing. I'm not naive. I, 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 I'm, I, I get it. And I understand that writing a $2 trillion check 
is an enormous amount of government spending from a government that I'd like to see spend as little as possible. But that spending went to the American people. I know there was a bunch of stuff in there. I know that there was money for the Kennedy Center. I know all of that. I understand that that's politics and I hate it, but nevertheless, the bottom line is the government did what the government is supposed to do. If the government tells you you can't go to work, or at least you shouldn't, then they're, they're doing their best to make up for it. And, and to say that it's $2 trillion on a, on, a, on a 25 or $30 trillion national debt at this point and for many years now, I've just been saying, put it on the tab, man. Nobody's serious about paying this down anyway. Right now, let's get people money so they can stay in there with food. No one's being evicted. Banks aren't saying we're foreclosing on your property, whether you can pay or not. Everybody's saying, no, we're going to work it out. Banks are saying this. Retailers, everybody's saying it. So why don't we just stop beating ourselves up and stop and stop constantly, constantly saying, you know, oh, my God, my God, my God. Why don't we just try for an instant to look at this unpopular radical theory of mine that namely we have done this with extraordinary, extraordinary generosity and competence and, and, and have saved a lot of American lives because I don't want to live in a society that does a cost-benefit analysis on your life based on how old you are, how likely you are to die or anything like that. I find that anathema. I find it disgusting. It's why I, ha why I fight socialized medicine. And that's why I'm voluntarily staying at home. So now to the future, what happens? What's the world look like? What does America, I don't care about the world right now, what does America look like after this is all over? Well, I said that I thought everybody was doing a great job with one exception. And there is one exception. And the one exception to this is not an individual. It's not even Nancy Pelosi. And I thought a lot of stuff she did was reprehensible, but they're people and it's politics. And I expect reprehensible behavior from politicians. That's why I live in a country that's done its best to eliminate political power in one place as much as possible. What happens going forward? Well, the one exception to me is the media. Their credibility had continued to fall. It had fallen throughout the last 15 or 20 years. Their credibility in the 2016 campaign left uh, the world and left the country in, in shatters. The credibility after the impeachment thing. But all of those things were political things that were out there. This has affected everybody at home. The media, the, the, the so-called professional media, has been absolutely reprehensible. They've been incompetent. They've been malicious, they've been childish, and they've been wrong. And the one thing that they've done consistently is everything in their power to cast blame on people in, and, and the fact that they destroy the morale of the United States population in order to get their political advantages from their political opinions means to me that the media is absolutely evil. It's just plain evil. And as John Galt points out, and as an old joke, nobody watches CNN. Nobody watches CNN anymore because the airports are closed. That's the only time you'd ever watch CNN. So we know what they are. When when guys like Jake Tapper or or, um, or uh, Costa ostensibly ask the president a question, but really just essentially are just trying to provide a point and make the prosecution, we know what they are. And Donald Trump knows what they are. And he treats them with the, with the appropriate amount of contempt. And I think everybody's catching on to that. I, I just think they are. So going forward, what do we get out of this? What's the future look like? I think we get to go back to work sooner rather than later. I think when we get to go back to work, the enthusiasm for going back to work, this is an enforced vacation. It's a stressful vacation. But I have never seen so many people ever in this country basically express a wish that they could get the hell out of the house and stop laying around doing nothing and get back to work. And I think about that for a second. When this stuff starts to ease and we get to the downside of this infection curve, which are, we are approaching more soon and at lower rates than we thought we would, much lower, then we'll go back to work. And we, most of us, most of us will go back to the jobs that we had before this whole thing happened. And I imagine a lot of us are going to be putting a lot of overtime and getting a lot of overtime paid for it. Some of us will not have jobs that were there before. But I think that the idea that this, that this has caused a depression, I just don't, it just doesn't make sense to me. If a company had to go out of business 
because they didn't have the resources to either pay their rent or so on. I don't see anybody being thrown out on rents. I don't see anybody collecting rents. There's nobody in line behind you to pay your rent. If I got, a, if I got an eviction notice from this office because I couldn't pay the rent, what are they going to do? They're going to they're going to put somebody else in here to make money. In a normal economy, the answer would be yes. Here, no. The whole system is is in a state of medically induced coma, and it just wants to wake up. And when it wakes up, it's going to want to jog around the the block for a while. And when I think when we come out of this, some of the lessons we're going to learn are going to be some prominently important lessons that are nothing but good for America and nothing but good for freedom, too. The first thing we're going to learn is that the media is absolutely against this, the country. It has no loyalty. It has no connection to the to the welfare of the American people. It is a political, a political partisan bludgeon that gets less and less and less useful every day. And now it is just a giant Nerf club carried by a caveman in a Halloween costume. It's just a joke. It's over. People have found other means of getting the news. I find that all the celebrities that were so, so enamored with themselves, who started singing Imagine to us to keep the American people calm, you know, my God, what we really need is our celebrities to tell us that everything's okay. Seeing them at home without makeup, seeing guys like uh, Steve Colbert and Seth, uh, uh, whatever his name is, and, 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 and Jimmy Kimmel at home without makeup and more especially without writers, Shows us that they're not particularly funny people. They're not particularly deep people. They're not smart. They don't have any insights. My, uh, Seth Meyers. They're just bunches of people who happen to get a job on network TV. They have no talent and nobody cares. Their, it, their prestige is, is enormously lower. Celebrities in general, which celebrity worship is, is, the, is the greatest single luxury disease that a country can have. We pay attention to the Kardashians because, honest to God, there is nothing going on in the world that should take our attention. If we are paying attention to the Kardashians, that means the world is humming along because you don't have time to pay attention on people like that if there are serious problems to deal with. And now we do have a serious problem to deal with. And what we find is, all across the country, not just conservatives, when, when Gal Gadot came out with that Imagine video, Everybody in the country, not just conservatives, everybody in the country said, will you please just go away? The last thing we need are a bunch of multimillionaires singing a hippie song about no heaven while people are dying, no countries while, while China has caused this thing to be unleashed around the world, and you're sitting there in a $50 million mansion, and you're singing about imagine no possessions so that I don't lose my morale? Piss off! We don't want to see you anymore. That's an enormous benefit that's coming out of this. We're finding that the humor, the real humor, which I did my right angle on today, is coming from the American people. We're finding that the courage is coming from the American people. We're finding the spirit is coming from the American people. Friendliness is coming from American people. But the big win coming out of this, the big, big win coming out of this, and this is what's going to make up for the economic damage that we have suffered and do it quickly too, is that this has shown us what we are capable of doing as a people if you would just Get the government red tape out of the way. When I saw the first two weeks of this, and I saw the number of companies that were like, everybody, you know, when I say everybody mocked Pillow Guy, no, it wasn't everybody mocked My Pillow Guy. The news media mocked the My Pillow Guy. But that guy got up there and said, we should be praying, we should thank God we have a president who knows what he's doing, and I'm taking my company, which I have put my money into, I was a lifeline drug addict, by the way, until I turned around, and I am taking my company, and we're not making uh, my pillows anymore for profit, we're making 50,000 masks a day, and we're just going to put them where they're needed. That kind of thing is unparalleled. We've seen it. We see it everywhere. We see this kind of spirit, but when you, but when you, when you look at how fast we moved on drug therapies, how fast we moved on this chloroquine thing, and, and what, what, absolute, what absolute asshats the press made out of themselves and continue to make out of themselves on this chloroquine thing, it came out of nowhere. And within, I reported on this chloroquine thing early, and they were saying, oh, well, we might take two or three months to get approval. No, Donald Trump approved it the next day. And two days after that, it was in clinical trials in New York saving lives. Okay? When we first uh, got the story from Johns Hopkins at the beginning of this, and I reported on it that, that this idea of 
taking plasma from people who had recovered from the disease, straining, taking the plasma, antibodies coming with it. It's a uh, term, uh, Lord Bias called it flash immunity. It gives us at least temporary immunity, gets people through their, through their symptoms. They said that when John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins submitted the report saying, we think this works. Really? Yes. Q&A on Johns Hopkins website. How long do you think it will take? Well, before it would have taken us months and months and months, years probably. But now we hope to get an approval to go ahead with it within two to three weeks. And it was approved the next day or two days later. Approved. The lesson that we're getting out of this is, yes, some regulations are necessary, but by God, we live under this under this burden of regulation and red tape that just slows so far everything down. And when you have enough of a crisis to move that stuff out of the way, what we are capable of producing is mind boggling. I've seen more advances in microbiology, virology, epidemiology, all the medical skills. I've seen more progress in the last three weeks than I've seen in my entire life. And I think, I think we're just getting started. I think that this has been good for the country because it will be for the first time really since 9-11, and 9-11, 9-11 was a shock to the system, but it was a shock to the system that came and went. And by the way, for people who think, again, that this whole thing's kind of overblown, we're losing a 9-11 worth of people every day or two in this country. We lost 3,000 Americans in, on 9-11, and we remembered that for 20 years, and rightfully so, and I'll never forget it. But if we, if we saw those towers come down and we saw nearly 3,000 people die in front of our eyes, we're seeing more than 3,000 people dead in New York City now. That doesn't count? It doesn't count? Different? It's not different. Which brings us to the, to the closing point and the main point. What we saw on 9-11 was we saw an attack on the United States of America, premeditated attack on the United States of America. We saw 3,000 Americans die. We saw airplanes flying into buildings. We saw smoking rubble. And after that, we went out there and we took over two countries that were, that were hotbeds of terrorism or, or, or havens for them. And we went out there and we have made terrorism in the last 20 years. We have made terrorism a statistical blip. If you remember the days after 9-11, and I do, I thought every single day, I went for three or four or five years, could not watch a Super Bowl game halftime without thinking, where's the explosion? Something's going to blow up any second now. And over time, we began to realize, no, when America decides to do something about something, it takes a lot to wake us up, but it takes a lot to wake everybody up. That's human nature. When terrorism hit us enough to get our attention, terrorism, world terrorism, is gone. I'm not saying there aren't individual cases. We had 8 billion people here. But you may remember Al-Qaeda with 80,000 warriors that were going to come to the U.S. Didn't go to the U.S. Went to Iraq and Afghanistan where they got killed by U.S. Marines and Army and Air Force and Navy. You may remember um, ISIS, which was a political uh, reality. Remember people being lined up in orange jumpsuits having debt cord explosives around their neck and blowing their heads off altogether. And all of a sudden, we decided, no, we we're going to elect a president who's going to do something about that. And they're gone. They're gone. The, the human immune system protects you against known threats, but it doesn't protect you against unknown threats. You have to get the infection. You have to fight the infection. You have to go through the fever and the sickness and all of that other stuff. And if it doesn't kill you, you know what to look for in the future, and then you fight it, and it never gets a chance to get a foothold again. It's exactly what happens with the United States. We didn't know that a sneak attack on our fleet was possible. We knew it intellectually, but we didn't believe it. And then it happened. And when it happened, we took our hits, and we took our fevers, and we took our losses, and then it never happened again. We knew that terrorism was a threat in the, in the world. We knew that terrorism was a threat. We'd seen them blow up the coal and other things. We never really took it seriously. Then we got the infection. 9-11 happened. Buildings came down. And we developed the antibodies necessary so that we don't have to deal with terrorism anymore. So that leaves us with China. And that leaves us with globalism. And that leaves us with a lot of things that were slowly, slowly, slowly starting to take the, the, the foundation of this country out from underneath us. And we lived through at least a decade now and probably more like 20 years of the same people 
that have done everything they can to destroy the morale of the American people. The same people that talk about, he made a mistake, he should have done this, didn't do that. Those people have been telling us for 20 years now that the 21st century is going to be the Chinese century, that the future belongs to China. China's going to go to the moon while we just sit here and watch because we don't know how to do it anymore because we're too stupid. That China's going to continue to just basically rape us on these, on these deals, that they're going to take all our money, they're going to buy all our stuff. They're the future. China's the future. How many times have you heard this? Oh, the Chinese Navy's making six destroyers for every destroyer we make. China's making aircraft carriers now, just a matter of time before they control the whole world. It's inevitable. Look at all the new buildings they have. Why not just accept it? Just accept it. We had our time. America had its time. It was a good run. Now it's China's turn. I never believed that. I never, ever, ever did. And now the whole country knows. Not only that China is an enemy of this country, I don't believe that this was, this was not a biological weapon. If it was a biological weapon, it would be more deadly than it is, and it wouldn't have been launched in Wuhan. But I do believe there's ever-increasing evidence that it is a virus that escaped from a Wuhan lab. And there is no question, none whatsoever, that the Chinese knew about it, that the Chinese knew it was infectious, communicable, and that, and that it was spreading, and they lied, and they lied, and they lied, and they continue to pump money into the World Health Organization, which is absolutely with zero credibility before this, and now is simply just a... I, I, I don't include Chinese statistics, and I don't talk about the World Health Organization, because they're, 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 they're frauds. They're just scams. It's just a joke. It's a... It's a, it's a it's a set. It's a movie set, is what the World Health Organization is. So where do we go now? Well, when it's over, when it's over, we're going to look at this. And when, when we are back to work and when all of this stuff is settled down, we're going to look at this. And we're going to see 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, who knows, 50,000, I don't know, how many Americans are going to die as a result of this virus. And I do know what we did when we saw 3,000 Americans die. And if you were one of those people that were a jihadi and thought that America was weak and finished, you were in for a bit of a surprise because, uh, because those, those um, al-Qaeda fighters who went to Iraq at the, at the whale of um, al-Zarqawi who was saying, hey, uh, bin Laden, uh, you need to send us everybody you've got here because we're trying to turn Iraq into a quagmire and you told us that Americans are a bunch of soft, uh, you know, latte-sipping uh, homosexuals who sit around in, in, uh, in hot tubs and drink Chardonnay all night. But I'm looking out the window at a bunch of U.S. Marines, and these Wu-Tang Clan mother effers are, are kicking our ass. So now, now we know. When it's over, we'll have realized that the Chinese government allowed this research to continue, that their incompetence meant that it got out of a lab. I'm believing this more and more every day. Or, if not, fine, that their wet markets and their desire to eat dogs alive and all the rest of it has created a situation which is a perfect absolute laboratory creation to create a, a worldwide pandemic of viruses from the animal population into the human population. I don't care which one you pick. Maybe it's both, but it's not neither. That is clear. They lied about it. They continued to allow thousands of people a day to leave their country fully aware that this was an infectious disease, and more and more and more it's looking like, well, if we're going to have to suffer from the coronavirus, and we better get make damn sure the rest of the world does too, we can't very well contain this in China and suffer the economic hits on our own if it turns out that we're going to end up losing all of this economic benefits and have all these deaths because of our incompetence and because of our totalitarianism. If it turns out it's spreading to the rest of the world, well, okay, good, let's share the misery, even though we created it. People have said that China is going to come out of this stronger. I just laugh out loud at that. I'm not buying another product that's made in China ever. You know, when you talk to people from, from, who went through World War II, especially the people who were in, in combat in World War II, you will find people who, uh, who fought in World War II, Marines, let's say, and they would not buy a product that was made in Japan. They wouldn't do it until the day they died in the 1990s, 2000s. Japan's been a strong ally of ours ever since, doesn't matter to them, they would not buy it. My mother was a flight attendant, she was actually a stewardess for BOAC, which was British Overseas Airways Corporation, became British Air many years after she left service of it. But she was a flight attendant in the late 1950s for BOAC on the last of the propeller-driven propeller airliners. And she told me the story about a guy who was a captain on board one of these uh, Strato uh, cruisers, big propeller-driven uh, airliner, 
and she told me the story about this British captain who came on board, getting ready for a routine flight from London to New York, came on board, walked down the aisle, saw two Japanese businessmen, this would be 1957, sitting in a, in a row, minding their own business, and he said, I'm not flying this airplane. He just got out and walked out. He walked out. And, and they didn't have somebody sitting there ready to fly. The flight was delayed for hours and hours and hours. And the reason he walked out was because he'd been a prisoner of war of the Japanese during World War II as a bomber pilot in the Pacific. He'd been captured by the Japanese, had been in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, and he simply said, I'm not, you can fire me if you want to, I don't care, I don't, I don't give a damn about being fired, I'm not flying this airplane with those people on board. That is the attitude that this country is going to come out of with, with regard to China. As I said yesterday on the China show, China makes our stuff. We don't buy their stuff, they make our stuff. They're not, I'm not buying any more of, the, of, of our stuff that they make. And the fact that companies like 3M make personal protective equipment, not only did the Chinese send people out, their own citizens, basically give the word out through companies, tell all of your employees to buy all of the, of the PPE that we can find, all the hand sanitizers, all the masks, buy it all up, take it away from those, from those savages, those barbarian outsiders, and ship it back to China. Hoard it. To hell with them. If they don't have enough to protect themselves, too bad. Bring it into China. We need it. And then we'll hand it back to them as a humanitarian gesture so that they love us. No. Uh-uh. 3M, an American company with a factory in China, as one example, was not allowed to ship medical equipment back to the United States. The Chinese government paid them cost for it and confiscated it. If you think that China is going to continue to be in this position, you're wrong. This is the end of China as we know China. It's over for them. They make our stuff. And when, when the consumer decides that he's no longer going to buy something that's made in China, then the American companies that have parts made in China have a new fi financial calculation to make. Used to make sense that if you could make a widget and save 17 cents on the dollar by having the widget made or assembled in China, yeah, it makes sense. Prices are lower, sells to more people. Yeah, made in America is a nice thing, you know, but, you know, it's cheap. It's a good drill and it's a little bit cheaper, power drill. Those days are gone. They're gone. Um, so, so now the people who are manufacturing in China are going to find out that the American people are going to do what, what we're going to do. We're going to say we're not buying anything that's made in China anymore. And that means that the economic benefits of being in China evaporate. And they'll either have to put them somewhere else or bring them home. I hope they bring them home. But that's definitely going to come out of this. And I think finally, when it's all said and done, what we will come out of this with is a sense that we have been through something tough and that we did it together and that and that when it's over no it doesn't it turns out that there are not jeeps in the street with the big democratic party d and machine guns keeping us in our houses no i don't think that's what's going to happen i don't i trust the president because i don't think he's a politician and even if i didn't trust the president it wouldn't matter it's an emergency and when the emergency is over, we not only will go back to the freedoms we have, we'll be a much freer place than we were before. We will be a much less centralized place. Cities are finished. This whole Agenda 21 thing, done. This whole idea of packing people together and putting them on mass transit, you know, so that you can control them, that's not going to survive this virus. Not at all. What's going to survive is a sense of freedom, entrepreneurialism, the sense of gig-based economy. People are going to find that they don't need to live in cities on top of each other, in blue states run by corrupt politicians who take your money and provide you nothing. They're going to find they can work from home. And when they figure out they can work from home, they're going to figure out they can work from home in suburbs or in the country as well as they can in these miserable overpriced cities. It's the end of cities. It's not the virus. The virus is just pushing it along. This is coming anyway. All of this stuff is nothing but good for this country. Nothing but good. It's accelerating this decentralization that's been going on since the beginning of, um, of the information age. And it's shown us, no, we don't need to be living on top of each other and riding in subways to do our jobs. Homeschooling, everybody's had to homeschool. Everybody's a homeschool kid now. A lot of parents have realized, okay, well, we get together, maybe this isn't so tough. And that um, uh, indoctrination mill is enormously weakened. College students are having to take their classes online. They're having to do their own research online. Pretty soon it's going to occur to them that they're paying $60,000 a year for a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Can you do the job? Yes or no. Do you have the skills? Yes or no. 
I'm a, I have a degree. I don't even have a degree. I was a theater major. But I know many people who do have bachelor's degree in theaters, and I know people who have master's degree in theaters, and has that helped them get a single job in acting? Not at all. A little different for engineering and medicine, but nevertheless, you get the point. It's all, when I say it's all over, I don't mean it's all over for the country. The country's going to come out of this bright and shiny and new. It's all over for the, for the red tape. It's all over for this media complex. It's all over for globalism. It's all over for the idea that there's no such thing as countries and we really don't need borders. It's all over for the media celebrities. It's over for the news people. It's over for Hollywood. All of it. It's done. It was going to happen anyway. The virus just made it happen a little faster for all of us. And when it's done, we're going to come out with a crisis under our belts. And I say under our belts because when you took, take a look at what made people patriotic, when you take a look at what made people love the country, it was a crisis. Always. People after World War II were filled with patriotism because World War II scared the living daylights out of them, and rightfully so. So in the future, when it's done, the dust is settled and all the rest of it, people can say, we should have an economic system like China. You're welcome to go but they killed 100,000 of their own people so that they wouldn't lose face. Is that the system you want? Do you think when this is over and the Chinese people look at the number of casualties they've had to take and the amount of times they've had to watch those, those phony doctors getting off of those phony buses and saying, we won, we've defeated the virus, no new cases in China, as the crematoriums continue to burn? You think that government's going to survive this? I don't. I'll tell you why I don't think the government in China is going to survive, not because I think the Chinese people are going to have a big uprising, although that may happen. China's going to collapse as we know it because nobody's going to make their stuff in China anymore, period. That's it. That's all. No one. And if we decide to do things that I've heard, like, well, since China, by any reasonable court of law, is criminally negligent here, it's not a question of the we made a mistake, sorry, no. Criminally negligent. negligent. You were criminally negligent, and then you lied, and then you destroyed evidence. You continued to lie. People all around the world have died. Hundreds of thousands of people will die as a result of this lie. And the economic damage to the United States alone is trillions of dollars. I might want some compensation for that. I might want to be made whole. I might want to use the legal principles that apply all around the world that say that if you've damaged me and caused me harm, then it's not unreasonable for me to expect to be made whole by you. They're finished. They're done. It's another American century and always will be because when it's all said and done, despite all of the fire and the smoke and all of the, all of the hysteria and all of the people saying the country's finished and the sheep will, or Trump's incompetent and blah, 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 or corporations are benefiting or all of the noise and all of the stuff that we hear every single day and gets more and more toxic at the top, at the bottom where the people live, it's better and stronger every day. And when it's done, we'll have saved a lot of lives and be something to be proud of. And um, I'm proud of this country, and I'm more proud of it than I've ever been. And, I'm, and, I, and, and the fact, the fact that people in this country have been saying things like, it's all Donald Trump's fault, it's not real, or the people that have been saying it's a hoax, or the people that have been saying it's the end of the world, or the people that have been saying you're all a bunch of traitors for having gone along with the stay-at-home order, or those people that say that, no, you, you gun nuts are the people who are going to get people killed. My God, what's the matter? What? All of them. You know what it all means? It all means, when it's said and done, it means that this is a healthy, healthy place to live because none of those voices were silenced. None of those voices were shut up. None of those people advocating any of those positions disappeared like they did in China. None of them happened. No one told people the reason the country is healthy is because there's been so much absolute lunacy out there and everybody's had a chance to have their say and thanks to you I've had a chance to have mine. It's just, it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing place to live. Amazing place to live. It's more amazing every day. Anyway, that is, when it's all said and done, uh, and um, if it turns out that you feel that you can continue to stay with us after such a uh, remarkable display of um, uh, outrageousness, treason, uh, 
uh, anti-science and uh, obedience, then uh, I didn't hit the wrong button. I did that for effect. Um, then we'd love to have you as a member of BillWhittle.com. I just had to say that. I had to say thank you uh, to all our members. I say it every single time, and I mean it. And for the new members we've had, thank you. If this message meant anything to you, if you got anything out of it, made you look at this thing differently, uh, it's out there free because other people are paying for it for it to be free. If you want to be one of those people, we'd love to have you. Just go to BillWhittle.com and become a member. Uh, click on the link there, and you can be part of this new paradigm of citizen producers who are paying for the truth as we see it at the time. I think we should be very proud of ourselves. Um, but anyway, uh, that's just me. That's my opinion. And I live in a country where I get to express it. And so do you. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow right here on the Chronosphere Lounge. <laughs>